Welcome to History Nachos. History is more than just names and dates. It is the heritage of humanity. Here, we are all about the greatest real stories. So take a scoop and jump on in. More than 2,000 years ago, the Kingdom of Israel fell, and the Jews became a people without a nation. Over time, they spread to many countries, especially in Europe. They kept the heritage alive, and often became highly productive members of society, even when they faced discrimination and persecution. Fast forward to the 1930s. The Nazi party had taken over Germany. One of their main goals was eliminating the Jews, who they blamed for all the country's problems. The Nazis industrialized genocide and killed over 6 million Jews before they were stopped by foreign armies. Many Jews died because they had nowhere to flee. The remaining Jews swore never again would persecuted Jews be trapped and mass murdered. The time had come to reclaim the homeland as a safe haven. Welcome to episode 19, Deliver Us to the Promised Land. Establishing Israel. The destiny of mankind is not decided by material computation. When great causes are on the move in the world, stirring all men's souls, drawing them from their firesides, casting aside comfort, wealth, and the pursuit of happiness in response to impulses at once awe-striking and irresistible, we learn that we are spirits, not animals, and that something is going on in space and time, and beyond space and time, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. Winston Churchill Churchill was talking about the good versus evil aspect of World War II, but he also knew the general idea widely applies. I personally think this quote sums up Israel's history pretty well. Creating and defending the modern state of Israel was not just a series of political events. It was also a religious movement among both Jews and Christians. The Jewish and Christian faiths largely believe God set aside Israel for the Jews from the beginning. In the Hebrew Bible, it was one of the promises God made to Abraham, the founder of the Jewish race. This stuff literally comes from the first book of the Bible, and traces back to early civilization. After the original kingdom of Israel was conquered, Jews all over the world hoped to someday return to the Holy Land and establish a Jewish state again. In later generations, some were able to come back, but always lived under non-Jewish governments. To keep things simple, I will refer to the Jewish homeland as Israel throughout the episode. The modern nation of Israel is the realization of a dream over 2,000 years in the making. Before going any further, please remember to subscribe, comment, like, and share. Also, stick around at the end for bonus content. For those of you who want to find the music, it is all listed in the description. There is also extra bonus material on Parlor. This episode in particular is going to have a lot of links, photos, and videos. The Jewish people have one of the longest and most storied heritages on earth, so naturally I cannot tell the whole thing. The same principle applies to the incredibly complicated and nuanced matter of politics in the Middle East. For perspective, people have written voluminous books on these topics for thousands of years. I will pick up the story in the 1800s with the movement that led to creating the modern state of Israel. The Russian Tsars had conducted systematic persecution of Jews, which caused Jews in Eastern Europe to start organizing support for returning to the Holy Land. The movement was called the Lovers of Zion, now known as Zionism. Zionism really got traction when a visionary leader came along, an Austrian Jew named Theodor Herzl. Herzl was trained and licensed as a lawyer, but decided to become a journalist instead. He had dealt with anti-Semitism all his life, and even had to transfer high schools because of it. In 
Herzl got a big break in his early 30s when he became the Paris correspondent for Austria's top newspaper. Herzl's time in Paris during the 1890s would transform him into a seminal figure. Post-revolutionary France was supposed to be one of the most egalitarian European countries, but even there Herzl ran into anti-Semitism. He started believing that Jews had to consider other options besides cultural assimilation. In 1894, a Jewish officer within the French army named Alfred Dreyfus was accused of high treason. The trial turned into a gigantic national controversy. The public turned against Dreyfus, with hardly any evidence of guilt. In fact, the whole thing might have been a frame-up. The Dreyfus affair is an incredibly complicated story, but for this episode, the important part is that it resulted in a huge wave of anti-Semitism in France. Herzl watched as violent anti-Semitism swept across France. As Herzl saw the Dreyfus affair unfold, his life's purpose came into focus. Herzl devoted himself to promoting the Zionist cause. In 1896, Herzl published The Jewish State, where he laid out the case for establishing a Jewish nation in their ancient homeland. It went viral, and Herzl became a major thought leader in the Jewish community. Within 18 months, Herzl organized a congress of Jewish representatives from all over the world. The first Zionist Congress became the starting point for an organized political movement. In his opening address, Herzl asserted, We want to lay the foundation stone for a home that is destined to be a safe haven for the Jewish people. Herzl spent the rest of his life tirelessly pursuing that goal. Herzl even negotiated with the Ottoman Empire, which controlled Israel at the time. Ultimately, the Ottomans decided not to hand over their territory. However, the British became highly sympathetic toward the Zionist cause. The British Empire offered 6,000 square miles of its colonies in East Africa to become the Jewish state. Herzl was on board, but most of the movement decided to hold out for the actual homeland. They were grateful to Britain, but there was simply no substitute for the real thing. Within a year, Herzl died of a heart condition. He was only 44. Fortunately, by the time of Herzl's death, the Zionist cause was strong enough to continue without him. Many of the Jews within the Zionist movement lived in Russia. At the turn of the 20th century, Russia became politically unstable and widely persecuted Jews. It caused Russian Jews to leave in droves. Quite a sizable group headed for Israel. By the outbreak of World War I in 1914, roughly 90,000 Jews lived in their ancestral homeland under the Ottoman government. World War I proved to be another big moment in the effort to create Israel. The Zionist movement still had deep ties with the British Empire. The top Zionist leaders were actually Russian Jews who had moved to Britain. As World War I raged in 1917, the Jewish leaders succeeded in getting a public promise from Britain's foreign secretary, Arthur James Balfour. The Balfour Declaration told the whole world that Britain supported creating a Jewish state in Israel. The Balfour Declaration was consistent with British public sentiment, but it also had strategic purposes. The British Empire desperately wanted the United States to become militarily involved in World War I. The Balfour Declaration was partially intended to appeal to American Jews, so they would promote intervention on Britain's side. Britain's leaders were also thinking long term. The British Empire needed to keep control of the Suez Canal in Egypt to stay connected to India and the oil fields of the Persian Gulf. Israel would be in a perfect position to act as a friendly buffer state protecting the eastern side of the canal. Britain's allies also endorsed the Balfour Declaration. After World War I, 
the League of Nations officially recognized it. The Ottoman Empire was also on the losing side of the war, so now the Middle East belonged to the British Empire and its allies. Jews began to immigrate to their ancestral homeland in order to set up a Jewish society under British rule. Israel soon became a semi-autonomous part of the British Empire. It was very close to the dream of a Jewish state. Then a massive curveball hit the Jewish community. In the 1930s, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party took power in Germany. They brought anti-Semitism to a whole new level and sought world domination. Under the Nazis, Jews faced some of the worst racial and religious persecution in human history. Their basic civil rights were stripped away, and they were routinely physically attacked. Things escalated until the Nazis decided to implement a final solution to the question of Jews in Germany. Kill or imprison them all. Jews were sent to death camps by the millions. Places like Auschwitz used industrial technology to become human slaughterhouses. Whenever Germany took over new territory, Nazis hunted down Jews like animals and sent them to the camps. In early 1945, Allied armies started pushing into the German heartland. Soldiers were horrified to find the camps. The true extent of Nazi crimes against humanity was exposed to the world. Many of those responsible were tried by an international court and sentenced to death. The Jewish community swore a solemn oath, never again. It was now undoubtedly time to establish a haven state for the Jews. If you do not know much about the details of the Holocaust, please, please, please look it up. It will be horrific and unsettling. However, understanding what, why, and how the Holocaust happened in a modern society is vital knowledge for anyone today. Links to the Holocaust Museum's website are in the description and posted on Parlor. During and after the Holocaust, many Jews fled to Israel. At the end of World War II, Britain and the United States immediately began coordinating on how to make a Jewish state. American soldiers had witnessed the death camps firsthand, and now the United States was all for Zionism. The proposal to create Israel as a Jewish state quickly made it into the United Nations. Ultimately, the UN authorized creating a Jewish state and an Arab state. Jerusalem would be an international city due to its wide religious and historical importance. The terms would take effect in May 1948. Until then, Britain would still control Israel as a colony. However, violence erupted in the Holy Land between Arabs and Jews. It looked more like modern terrorism than armies squaring off. Both sides were massacring each other on a regular basis. The British occupying forces did their best to keep the peace, but this was way outside of their wheelhouse. While there had always been a certain level of tension between Arabs and Jews, this was different. For centuries under the Ottoman Empire, they were able to at least live together without constant violence. In the 1800s, there was a rise of incidents and massacres, but nothing like a protracted war. Something had changed. It could be that the idea of a Jewish state ignited age-old tensions. However, there is a much more interesting theory about the shift. The Nazis had seen Arabs as potential allies against the Jews, and had cultivated relationships with radical Arabs. They also taught Arab sympathizers how to wage organized guerrilla warfare. Those combat methods became what we now call Radical Islamic Terrorism. I know it sounds kind of out there, but the Discovery Channel actually did a full documentary on this subject called Nazi Jihad. I strongly suggest watching it and drawing your own conclusions. If the theory is true, 
it would explain a lot of violence in the modern Middle East. As the big day for independence drew near, the Israeli Jews rallied behind one of their main leaders, David Ben-Gurion. He was one of the Russian Jews who had resettled in Israel before World War I. David Ben-Gurion had been a prominent leader among Israel's Jews from the beginning. He was a critical figure at every stage of Israel's early development. For the last couple of years, he had worked with Israel's Jewish militias to build up an underground military. They soon united to form the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF. It remains Israel's military to this day. The British put tight restrictions on importing weapons, but David Ben-Gurion knew he could not leave his people defenseless. Then the big day came and proved him right. On May 15, 1948, Britain withdrew. The prior evening, David Ben-Gurion had declared Israel's independence. Within minutes of Israel's statehood taking effect, all of the surrounding Arab nations declared war and launched an invasion on all fronts. The previously underground militias now became Israel's army. They faced five well-trained and well-equipped national militaries. Israel was in for the fight of its life. After some initial losses, Israel was able to hold the line. In July 1948, the tide turned and Israeli forces began pushing back the Arab armies. Israel quickly retook all its original territory, and then some. In less than a year, all the Arab countries negotiated for peace. Israel had finally won its sovereignty. Now Israel was secure, but far from safe. It was still surrounded by enemies. The Arab nations had failed in destroying Israel by force, so they tried undermining the Jewish state by political and economic means. The Jordanians are a notable exception, but I will get to that in a bit. There was also the issue of Palestinian Arabs. Hundreds of thousands had already left, but quite a few remained. During the war, the Israeli government also forcibly relocated some Palestinians who lived in strategic areas into refugee camps indefinitely. It is still a hot point of contention today. As part of the armistice, Israel traded some of its land for peace. These areas would be occupied by Arab nations, and are still major centers of the Palestinian population, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. As Israel's equivalent of George Washington, David Ben-Gurion was elected its first prime minister. Like Washington, he set tons of precedents that still guide Israel today. The relationship between religion and state in particular became a huge political issue. Building up the Jewish population became a major goal for Israel's survival. Less than a year after the War of Independence ended, the Israeli parliament passed the Law of Return, making all Jews citizens of Israel. All over the world, Jews jumped at the chance to live in the Holy Land under a Jewish state. Holocaust survivors in particular flocked to Israel. The first couple of years were pretty rough. The economy struggled, racial tensions among Jews from different parts of the world emerged, and the threat of annihilation was ever-present. Things started to turn around in 1952, when Israel got international foreign aid, especially from Jewish charities and the American government. West Germany even provided financial aid to Israel as part of an effort to right the wrongs of the Holocaust. Obviously, it is not the kind of thing that can just be fixed by money, which is why Germany has also done many other major gestures and highly reformed its culture. Anyway, back to the main story. While the Arab nations were all publicly against Israel, one leader secretly wanted peace, King Abdullah of Jordan. He had no problem making unofficial agreements with Israel, 
He also annexed the West Bank instead of turning it into a Palestinian state, which angered the rest of the Arab world. Within a year, King Abdullah was assassinated by a Palestinian. However, Abdullah's grandson quickly rose to the throne and continued secretly working with Israel. Egypt was on the other end of the spectrum. The Egyptian government did everything in its power to take out Israel, short of open war. Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip and encouraged Islamic terror there. In four years, the terrorists killed hundreds of Jewish civilians with constant suicide attacks. Later on, these terrorist groups would join together to form the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO. By early 1953, Israel had enough and sent the IDF after the terrorists. At times, it resulted in pitched battles. The IDF struck blows that brought the danger level down to a manageable risk. However, Israel now faced a much more serious threat. In Egypt, a radical new leader had seized power in a military coup. Gamal Nasser. During the height of the Cold War, he turned Egypt into a socialist dictatorship. Nasser also openly hated Israel. The free world was deathly afraid of communist expansion, especially near allied nations like Israel. It was at this moment Nasser stepped onto the world stage and tried to play the free world and Russia against each other. America and Britain had promised to give Egypt serious money in hopes of keeping Nasser from siding with Russia. Nasser accepted the promises, then went to the Russians and made an arms deal anyway. America and Britain decided to pull the funding. Nasser reacted by seizing the Suez Canal from Britain. He was messing with Israel's top allies and trying to gear up Egypt to take out the Jewish state. The British and the French could not afford losing their connection to the oil fields of the Persian Gulf. They were willing to resort to drastic action to keep the Suez Canal. Instead of giving in to Egypt, they reached out to Israel and hatched a plan. Israel would invade and defeat Egypt, then Britain and France would intervene to negotiate peace. Naturally, Returning the canal would be one of the peace terms. In 1956, Israel invaded Egypt and completely stomped the Egyptian military. Israel held up its end by taking a huge chunk of Egypt with minimal casualties. The second part of the plan got messed up for Britain and France due to international politics. In less than six months, Israel withdrew and gave the territory back to Egypt. Nasser became a hero in the Arab world for withstanding an attack from Israel. However, everyone with real power saw how effective Israel's military could be on the offensive. Without foreign intervention, Israel could have easily taken out Egypt. It bought Israel a decade of relative peace. In 1967, things started ramping back up. After a bunch of terrorist attacks coming from just across the border, Israel launched a series of reprisals to get the situation under control. Obviously, Israel's Arab neighbors did not take kindly to this. It got to the point where Syrian and Israeli jets fought each other in a skirmish. The Israeli pilots shot down several Syrian jets, which caused outrage in the Arab world. Syria was Soviet Russia's biggest ally in the Middle East, so the Russians started encouraging other Arab nations to join Syria in attacking Israel. Russia also ran interference for the Arab nations on the world stage. If Israel's Western allies intervened, they would risk World War III with Russia. For the time being, Israel was on its own. Nasser saw it as another chance to take down Israel, so he started acting aggressively. In 
He massed the Egyptian military on the Israeli border and blockaded Eilat, one of Israel's most critical ports. Under conditions of the time, the blockade functionally served as a declaration of war. Nasser also put together an alliance of Israel's Arab neighbors. When fighting broke out, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq would all get involved. Israel saw the writing on the wall and decided to launch a preemptive strike. What happened next became one of Israel's most defining moments. Israeli jets streaked across the Egyptian border and destroyed 90% of Egypt's air force on the ground. In the north, they also decimated Syria's air force. Israel now controlled the skies. In just three days, Israel pushed Egypt all the way back to the Suez Canal and drove Jordan out of the West Bank. Egypt and Jordan quickly accepted a ceasefire. Now Israel focused its military might on Syria and the fortified Golan Heights. Taking the heights would require heavy fighting. Confident in its position, Syria refused to accept peace. Then Israel took the Golan Heights in one day. Syria quickly agreed to a ceasefire. The whole conflict lasted less than a week, which is why it is still known as the Six Day War. It was one of the most lopsided victories in modern history. Israel was now unquestionably the region's leading military power. The Six Day War sent a clear message. Threatening Israel was risky business. After the Six Day War, the UN struck a deal with Israel. In exchange for Israel giving up some of the land it had gained, the UN passed a resolution recognizing the right of every nation to live free from threats within secure and recognized boundaries. Theoretically, it meant the Arab nations had to stop constantly threatening and invading Israel. The Arab League met together and basically decided to tell the UN to pound sand. At a conference in Sudan, they agreed to the three no's of Khartoum. No peace. No negotiations. No recognition of Israel. The Arab nations harassed Israel with tons of border skirmishes instead of all-out invasions. For example, Egypt would shoot artillery over the border and Israel would respond with airstrikes. For years it went on like that and became known as the War of Attrition. However, there was a glimmer of hope when Gamal Nasser died in 1970. He was succeeded by Anwar Sadat, who was radically different. Sadat toned down the fighting and expressed openness to negotiating with Israel. Of course, he only offered peace in exchange for unrealistic demands. At least it was a start. Israel also faced a new challenge. Its new territories contained over a million Arabs. Islamic terrorism spiked now that it was backed by a huge local support network of sympathizers who blended into the Arab communities. Israel needed to keep a lid on things and crack down hard on terrorism inside its borders. Now it became quite difficult for the terrorists to operate within Israel. So the terrorists decided to get creative and target Jews abroad. They started kidnapping people and hijacking planes. The most notorious attack occurred in 1972. At the Olympic Games in Munich, a team of Palestinian terrorists broke into the living quarters and killed 11 Israeli athletes. It shocked the whole world. Israel responded by systematically hunting down and assassinating the leadership of the responsible organization. Barely a year later, Egypt and Syria decided to take another shot at invading Israel. Egypt and Syria needed the element of surprise, so they attacked on one of the holiest days in the Jewish faith, Yom Kippur. Israel's borders were still guarded, but the forces were reduced so soldiers could go home for the holidays. The attack caught Israel completely by surprise. 
Those left on the front lines were vastly outnumbered and outgunned. But it was up to them to hold the Arab armies at bay until Israel could fully mobilize. One thing was for sure. Everything was at stake. It was time to hold the line or die fighting. Through bravery, skill, and sheer luck, they were able to pull it off. Then came the counteroffensive. Israel was done with getting invaded. The IDF pushed deep into enemy territory. In a matter of days, they were closing in on Cairo and Damascus, the capitals of Egypt and Syria. The tables had turned. After a couple of weeks, the UN intervened and emphatically called for a ceasefire. It was like a referee ending a lopsided boxing match. Peace negotiations began. It all looked like the same old cycle, but this time Israel's victory would actually lead to lasting peace. The Yom Kippur War had major consequences. On a global scale, America's support for Israel is why the Arab nations cut off the oil supply in 1973 and caused a world crisis. In the Middle East, the war cost tons of lives, money, and military equipment for everyone involved. As a result, Egypt and Syria were more willing to negotiate for demilitarized zones at the borders. After a few years, Egypt went one step further. Sadat started reaching out to Israel. In 1977, he visited Jerusalem and presented a permanent peace plan to Israel's parliament. U.S. President Jimmy Carter mediated peace talks, which resulted in the Camp David Accords in 1978. The Accords officially ended the perpetual state of war between Israel and Egypt. Within a year of the Camp David Accords, Israel and Egypt signed a formal peace treaty. Israel agreed to give the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt in exchange for Egypt recognizing Israel and normalizing diplomatic relations. That also meant allowing business, trade, and tourists to go back and forth. Sadat had just gone against all of the three no's of Khartoum. For the first time, an Arab government officially recognized Israel. Egypt was also a rather influential and powerful Arab nation that had acted as one of the main antagonists against Israel for decades. Egypt's endorsement carried significant weight. However, the Arab governments shunned Egypt for making peace with Israel. Two years after signing the treaty, Anwar Sadat was assassinated by Islamic terrorists. I personally consider the Egypt-Israel peace treaty as the final step in establishing Israel because it marked an end to the massive invasions. Israel still has to deal with Islamic terror groups and political hostility from Arab governments, but the Egypt-Israel peace treaty made it clear that Israel was here to stay. Theodore Herzl's dream had come true. Israel was now an independent, thriving, and powerful country. To this day, Israel strives for peace while remaining able to defend itself. It keeps the holy sites open to the world, including Arab Muslims. Recently, even more Arab governments have followed Egypt's example and formally recognized Israel. There is hope for peace in the Middle East. This episode is dedicated to all those who have striven, fought, and died to establish or protect Israel. People like the pioneering spirits who constructed a society from the ground up, the men and women who have served in the IDF, and the Jews and Arabs who have risked their lives to build peace. I think they are all summed up by Isaiah 32:17 from the Hebrew Bible. The work of righteousness will be peace. You have officially made it. 
to the bonus material, the guacamole on these history nachos. Stick around to hear about the aftermath, modern relevance, or anything else we decide to throw in. After the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Theodore Herzl wrote this in his personal journal. If I had to sum up the Basel Congress in one word, which I shall not do openly, it would be this. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I were to say this today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. In five years, perhaps, and certainly in 50, everyone will see it. 51 years later, the nation of Israel declared independence. Herzl's life is a testament to the impact one determined person can have on the world. The bonus content on this one could be an episode in its own right. At every stage, there are tons of moving parts and compelling individual stories. I will post some of the ones that made it into History Channel shows on Parlor. If you want to hear more about Theodore Herzl, Encyclopedia Britannica has an excellent article on him. It is written by David Ben-Gurion himself. For anyone interested in the Arab-Israeli wars, Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a great summary of them all. I also want to mention one of the big themes that runs through Israel's history. Divine Intervention. Whether you believe in a higher power or not, there are quite a few events that are considered miracles by the people who were there. At a minimum, they are statistical anomalies because of the level of sheer luck required. These perceived miracles are especially prominent during Israel's wars. Many can plausibly be attributed to freak chance. However, several critical events required beating million to one odds multiple times in an exact order at precisely the right moment. Granted, that happens every once in a while. But when it keeps happening, in a short time period, and consistently favors the same side in a war on holy ground, that is a pattern worth debating. There are plenty of accounts from Israeli soldiers, but to me, one of the most interesting cases is from the Arab side. The documentation for this one is not quite as solid, so take it with a grain of salt. However, if true, it would mean a miracle of Biblical proportions. During the Yom Kippur War, one of the deciding battles occurred in the Golan Heights at a place called the Valley of Tears. The military aspect alone defied massive odds. When Israel's defense was almost wiped out, the Syrian army pulled back for no apparent reason. Rumor has it that one of the Syrian commanders was captured and interrogated by Israeli intelligence. In that interview, the commander claimed he halted because he saw an army of angels and heard the voice of God command the Syrians to stop. That sounds like something straight out of the Old Testament. If Jews and Christians are right about God, it would explain a lot of the otherwise nearly impossible victories believe whatever you will. As always, we would love to hear your feedback. Our contact information and social media sites are in the description. Older episodes are all freely available on YouTube and BitChute. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider making a donation on Patreon or PayPal. Any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, thanks for listening.